Amen. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on. Amen. Let me look in the camera. Welcome everyone. Join us online at every location. So glad that you guys are here. What a powerful story. Wasn't that a powerful testimony, you guys? We're believing that through this unstoppable, unstoppable initiative that we are going to see um, a revival take place in our city, you guys, and that there'll be a legacy that we get to leave for our children and their children. So let me kind of uh, give you one last reminder for these unstoppable commitment cards. If you're part of our family here at Discovery, then you know what this is. And uh, this is the last week for you to get these in to be included in that celebratory um, next Sunday when I unveil the commitments uh, and, and what our target is landed at. We're tallying all these up. If you have been procrastinating for a few weeks, you guys, and you're like, I'm praying on it. Now's the time, like before next Sunday to get it in. Cause I like, I'm going to present the, like the number and where we're at to everyone. So you want to get in either today or sometime this week, give your unstoppable commitment so that you can be included, counted among the family who are committing together. Amen. You guys. Okay, so we're in this series, uh, The Names of God, and I'm so excited for this because I think in this series, you're going to get connected to God like you never have before because God is, is he's so creative and diverse, and there's so much to his nature and his character that is revealed to us through the story of history in the Bible, and he calls himself various names, and they weren't just like titles that were given to him, like platitudes or something, but they revealed who he was. They revealed um, how we would relate to him. They revealed what he likes and how he, how he operates and how we can know him better and deeper. So let me set up just a couple verses and I'll tell you where we're going today. Isaiah chapter 52, verse six, he says, I will reveal my name to my people and they will come to know its power. How many of you want the power of God? Anyone want that? Yeah. It's in the name of God that we can experience the power of it, uh, of of God. He, he reveals his power through his name, how we can relate to him, what we can expect, what we can declare and proclaim inside of the names of God. Psalm 124 verse 8 says it like this, our help is actually in the name of the Lord. So there's help for us in his name. When I know his name and what it is, I know where my help comes from and I can declare that name. Last week, you should go check it out if you miss it. We talked about the three foundational names of God. When I say foundational, I mean like every other name of his, of God's, which there are so many, how he has revealed himself to us. Every name is built from one of those names. They're called compound names. That's his foundational Elohim Adonai and Jehovah or Yahweh, those are his foundational. And then we have Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Nisi. You have these names that are compound names that include that. So you got to go check that out when you, when you get a chance. By the way, the two names, Yahweh, Jehovah, they're both, they're both meaning the same thing. They, they mean that relational, that relational God. But let me explain like why Maybe some people say it, say it differently, and maybe even different songs sing it differently. Yahweh is his Hebrew name. That's what Hebrew people call him, Yahweh. And they may pronounce that differently depending on the, their academic status. They may pronounce it differently, but it's Yahweh. And then, but when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Latin, there was no Y or W in the Latin alphabet. So they put a J and a V in there, and that's where we get Jehovah for many centuries, it, it has been Jehovah. So either way, sometimes you'll hear Jehovah, that's fine. Sometimes you hear Yahweh. Yeah, last week I said Jehovah. This week I'm gonna change it up and say Yahweh, okay? We're gonna say it like the Hebrews would say it. This week though, I'm gonna give you the first compound name of God, very powerful name. I'm gonna show you where we're going next here. You're gonna discover today, found in the story of David versus Goliath. Let me kind of set up this story very famous story, but we have Goliath of Gath. That's even a bad name. It doesn't sound like a bad dude. Goliath of Gath. There's a nine foot six beast of a man. NBA coach's dream right there. Nine foot six. So here's what happens. You got Israel on one mountain and the Philistines on another mountain. And in between them is a valley. And, and what would happen, and you can go read it for Samuel chapter seven. I don't got time to cover it all because I actually want to show you a lot of different ways that this name that I'm going to study with you today is revealed in the Bible. This is just the first time it's revealed with David versus Goliath. Goliath, though, will come out onto that battlefield in that valley 
for 40 days, he, day and night, okay, he would come out and taunt the Israelites with his big bad self and just ridicule them and taunt them. And here's what happens. David shows up in the battle scene. He doesn't even go, up, go to battle. His dad sends him to the battlefield to bring some sandwich and cheese and stuff to his brother. So he ain't even there to battle. But he hears this giant, Goliath, taunting Israel. And, and he says, in, in two different occasions, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that will come against the armies of the Lord? And that may sound like a, like not a cool dig. You know what I mean? It's not like, like bad trash talk today. You don't call him. But what he was saying, here's what it means. The circumcision was a sign of the covenant. Okay, and now a covenant was, was that relationship that God had with his people. That's what made him Jehovah and Adonai that we talked about. He, he, these people have a covenant relationship with Jehovah, meaning a covering. They were under the covering or the covenant of God, like an umbrella. Israel is under the umbrella covering covenant relationship of God. Now, an umbrella doesn't stop the rain. It just stops the rain from raining on you. That's what an umbrella does, okay? So, so he's hearing this guy, this giant, taunt and ridicule God's armies. He's saying, look at this. Wait a second. This guy don't even have an umbrella. This guy is he's not even under the covering of the protection of God. Who does he think he is to stand outside of the covering of God and try to taunt those who are in Christ or in God? Here's what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 17. David replies to Goliath. He says, you have come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you, here's our name, the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Yahweh Saba is his name. Somebody say Saba. Okay, the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So he doesn't come against and enter into battle against Goliath, against this giant in his own name. He doesn't enter into battle in the name of Saul and the king, king Saul in the name of Israel and any other name. He comes into this battle in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Very important of what he was seeing there. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Come on, that's gangster right there. Dude. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, off with your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistines army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know because of this, that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. So David was seeing something here that nobody else was seeing, you guys. So let me ask you a question. What battle are you in today? What are you fighting against? And what maybe are the weapons that your enemy has gathered against you? Because today, we're going to rise up and remind your enemy that Yahweh Saba is with you, the Lord of heaven's armies, the mighty warrior. And by his name, we're going to re-answer the battle today and win in Jesus' name. Okay, this is, this is his name, Yahweh Saba, write it down, the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of heaven's armies. M many of us don't, don't recognize God as this today because maybe we're not warriors as they were in Israel, but this is who God is. This is his name. In fact, check this out. This is one of the most used names of God in the Old Testament, used almost 300 times times the Lord of heaven's armies. Sometimes it says the Lord of hosts or the Lord our warrior, but it's the Lord of heaven's army that he is a warrior general God who commands an angelic army. And we don't see him this way. And I think because we don't see him this way that we're not fighting the, the battles the way that we probably should fight our battles. And all throughout the scriptures, we see kind of the, the, the angelic armies, the hosts through different prophets and visions that were given that this is who God is. He's, he's the Lord of heaven's armies. The prophet Daniel was given a vision of, of God and his angels where he saw what only he could describe as a hundred million angels around the throne of God. In the apostle John, in the book of Revelation, he saw a similar vision where, where around the throne of the lamb, there was a hundred million angels worshiping and crying out, to God. When Jesus was arrested in the garden, remember, Peter pulls out this sword and chops off the ear of the priest, and, and, and Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, don't you know that I can call on my father and he would dispatch 
More than 12 legions of angels at my charge? Now, he didn't do that. Obviously, he didn't do that. But he could. Because why? Because he's the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, when you look at these other names, that we'll study. We'll study these other names. But, but these, like Jehovah Jireh. A lot of you know Jehovah Jireh. We sang about Jehovah Jireh. It's a very popular name. You know how many, na- how many times that's used in the Bible? Once. Jehovah Rapha. We know his name. We sing about that again. You know how many times that's used? Once. Jehovah Nisi, once. Now, I'm not diminishing the, these names. These are, these are revealed. These are revelation of God, of who he is, his nature. And we can depend on that revelation and respond to his nature because how he has revealed himself to us. So I'm not limiting those names, but I am saying that there was an awareness that Israel had, the people of God had, that God fought their battles and fought for them. And because of that, they fought differently. And I think that if you saw God, the way that he sees himself, the way that he describes himself, that you'd fight your battles differently too. That you'd approach your giants differently. You'd approach the problems and the challenges and the foes that you have against you a little bit differently. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, he says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. So what giant do you have in your life today? What's what's a not, don't name the person or anything, Okay. (laughs) And, and, and even some of you, maybe you, maybe you thought of a name, but, but we don't battle against flesh and blood. That, uh, we, we battle against spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. When I say, who's your giant and what's your giant today? You don't name a person, you name a spirit. What's the spirit that stands again? What are the giants? Because some of you, you're battling a giant of fear. You're battling a giant of anxiety. You're battling a giant of rejection and abandonment. You're by battling a giant of despair or depression. You're battling a giant called your past. And the enemy wants to remind you of what you did and who you were. You're battling a giant called sin, taunting you day and day and day. Here's what I want to do today. I want to help you see Yahweh Saba to increase your faith. And then I'm going to show you what will happen if you start seeing God the way he describes himself, the Lord of heaven's armies. But In order to see God this way, we got to recognize the Lord of heaven's armies, that there is a perspective problem. I'm calling it perspective problems today. We have some perspective problems that we don't see God this way as the Lord of heaven's armies. So we're going to have to fight through our vision and our perspective. If you want to get to this place of great faith, where you operate in great faith, you got to get through four different stages of perspective problems to see God this way. Take some notes with me. Here's the first perspective problem I believe there is, and that is invisibility. Invisibility. Yeah, because this is where your faith begins. The Bible says faith is seen from God's perspective. It is a perspective, okay? That's what faith is. Faith is a way of seeing. Now, uh, wouldn't you agree with me that there's a lot of ways you can see something, a lot of different perspectives? If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. You got okay? If you got kids, you know what I'm talking about. There could be a dozen different ways you see from it, but it doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what you see. What matters is what God sees. And so what God operates, his army, the Lord of heaven's armies, he don't operate in this realm. There's a whole nother realm. It's, it's, the, the challenge we got to get over is this invisibility where God operates, where faith happens, but we don't see it. And because we don't see it, here's what happens. Child of God, man of God, woman of God. Here's what happens. Because we don't see it, we operate by our own understanding. We operate by our own strength. We operate by our own manipulation and maneuvering. We operate by our own initiatives. And and, and there's, James actually tells us, James chapter 315 says, there is a wisdom that operates like this. There's a wisdom that doesn't come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. No wonder we get ourselves into trouble. Then we're not seen with God's perspective. We don't have the right sight here. We don't see God for who he is. And because we don't see him as the Lord of heaven's army who goes before us and fights for us, I got to fight for myself. I got to win myself. I got to energy myself, strength myself, figure it out myself. But that kind of wisdom, the Bible says, comes from earth. It's, it's void of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be unspiritual. It is, does not have the Spirit of God. And because of that, it is demonic. Even if, listen, even if you win, even if you figure it out, even if you fix it with your own energy in your hands, it doesn't matter if it was void of the Spirit and it was of this world, then it was of de- demonic. 
So we got to get over this little, there's always an invisibility stage of faith. There always is. There, there, there's, it, this is the point, and it's huge. What we see determines what we think. And, and when we're asked to believe something, to commit ourselves to something that requires us to abandon the sense of sight, it takes us to the edge of our understanding. But having God's perspective is, has nothing to do with what you see. The, Philist, the, the, the Israelite army saw the same thing David saw in the giant. They were looking at the same giant. Look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24 and 25. It says, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, I mean, the same giant that David saw, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen this giant man? Yeah, they, they, they were seeing. Look, having God's perspective has nothing to do with what you see. It has everything to do with how you see what you see. And there's always this invisibility stage of faith. It's your perspective on what you're seeing, the lens of which you are seeing it through, your interpretation. There's this invisible stage where there's almost a nothing stage. A nothing. I don't, there's not, like, I don't, I don't see it. There's nothing here. My marriage is still broken. I still got the diagnosis. They're still against me. I'm still, I'm still don't have the promise that you even said, God. There's this nothing stage that your faith is going to have to fight through. But just because you don't see it doesn't mean that God didn't speak it. And just because your eyes can't see it doesn't mean God isn't moving. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It's not in your notes, but let me just read it to you. It says, what is faith? This is where we get the definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. And to be certain listen to what it says, of things we do not yet see. The key is yet. I'm certain of something I have yet to see. It's invisible right now. It's invisible, but I'm certain that the Lord of heaven's armies has gone before me and will fight for me. You're going to have to move through this invisible stage to see God for who he says he is. He is the Lord of heaven's armies, your warrior. Okay. Second Kings chapter six tells the story of, of, of the servant of the man of God, Elijah. They were surrounded by an enemy nation. And the Bible says that when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city, this enemy army. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. This is always what the enemy wants. If you can't see what God, who God is, then you're gonna live in fear. If you can't see who God is for who he says he is, that he is the Lord of heaven's army, you're going to live in fear. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw. He saw, the heaven, he saw heaven's armies. His, his full of the, the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So there is... A battle going on in heavenly realms. This is a battle that you and I, whether you know that you're engaged in or not, we are. It is absolutely real. And maybe sometimes we can't connect with stories like this in the Bible because you're not fighting a physical. You don't see a nine foot six giant, but your enemy is, is just as real. And because of that, because of that, your faith moves from not just the invisibility, but there's, you got to get through the, the second stage of insignificance. Because some of you, what you're looking at, you have a hard time, like I said, connecting to stories like this because you don't see the significance in your battle. You, you, don't, you, don't, you compare it and you go, I just, I just, you know, how do I relate to that? Listen, David was just delivering sandwiches and cheese to his brothers. But great faith feels like nothing at first. It feels like nothing. And although we have a hard time maybe sometimes relating to this, we need, we need to snap out of it and realize that we are in a war. There is a battle going on for our destiny, our purpose, for our children, for our legacy, and we need to snap out of it and fight the way that God has called us to fight. We need to learn to celebrate the seemingly insignificant starts. It looks like it's insignificant, but I'm telling you, this is significant. This is, like Zechariah chapter four, verse 10 says, do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see my work, the work begin. I want you to make this confession over your life. I hope you would make, like wherever you're at in your life right now, wherever you're at in your career or in your calling or in your marriage or in your education, wherever you're at, you need to start telling yourself, this is significant. 
that what I'm doing is significant. Where I'm at in my career, this is significant. I know it's not where you want to be and where God has told you, no, 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 but this is significant. Where I'm at in my family, where I'm at in my calling, where I'm at, this is significant. I'm greeting people at the door. I'm just a door greeter. No, 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 no. This is significant. Luke 16, Jesus says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. If you treat little things like they're insignificant, you're creating a pattern that won't be able to sustain the greater things God wants to do in your life. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, that's a test God says, I'm gonna test you with this, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Could it be that your perspective toward what God has given you in this season is preventing you from going on to the next season? You want breakthrough, you want it. But your perspective toward this season is, this isn't, this isn't that significant. This is insignificant. And you wonder, when is my life, when am I going to get there? When is my life going to finally make impact? When am I going to finally arrive at some place? And you need to realize this is significant. You don't wait for it to seem significant, for you to speak it as significant, because that takes no faith. It takes faith to say this is significant. And the devil's not going to like it when you start saying this is significant. Because, because check this out, the way he gets you to leave your assignment is to get you to think that what you're working on doesn't really matter. You don't see the significance of the small starts and the little things. Listen, the devil stands no chance against the Lord of heaven's armies, but if he can keep you from seeing it, he can keep you from receiving it. So, so you'll move through these stages. If you, you, you'll have to move through the invisibility stage and get over that. Get over what your eyes can't see. Okay? And then you're going you're gonna to have to fight through this stage of insignificance that, that this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. This third stage is intimidation. Intimidation. The enemy will try to intimidate you away from the battle. He'll try to intimidate you away from the breakthrough. He'll try to intimidate you away from your blessing. This is what he did, the giant Goliath did in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted, a taunt across the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? Why are you even coming? Why are you even trying? You ever feel that way sometimes? Why, 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 why are you even trying? This again? Really? You, again, you're messing around with the same thing? Why even try? Come on, how many times has the enemy tried to lie to you that way? Why even try? Why? And here's what he says. Uh, I am, but you are. This is what the enemy does. I am. I am great. I'm a champion, but you are just nothing. This is the taunt of the enemy in all different kinds of ways in all of our lives. He'll go, I am, this is, this is your giant. I am, and you can't, and you aren't. The enemy can't prevent, like, th this, is, this is his tactic, you guys. He'll try to intimidate you. This is what happened to Elijah. Because of Jezebel, she gets the report about Elijah. If you remember the story of Elijah, she, he destroys and humiliates 850 false prophets of Jezebel. And, and, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 18. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah, look what happened. He was afraid. Oh, he got his eyes off the Lord of heaven's armies. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. The enemy can't prevent God from blessing you, but he might be able to prevent you from receiving it. Jezebel can't kill Elijah. She knows she's no match for the man of God, the one who defeated 850 of her false prophets. She knows she can't kill him. So what does she try to do? Contain him. Do you know if the devil could kill you, you'd be dead by now. Okay, if he could take you out, you'd be out. But since he can't kill you, he tries to contain you by intimidating you. So Elijah runs away. And when you run from the battle, you run from your breakthrough. Well, this is why the enemy wants to intimidate you away from the battlefield. When you run from the battle, you're running from the breakthrough. Some of you are running from your breakthrough. You're running from the battle, and you're running from a breakthrough. You're running from something that's already defeated. You're running from the shame that's already been forgiven. 
You're running from situations that God has actually already worked out. You're running from things, outcomes that God has already determined. I will go before you and fight for you. And you're running. You're running. Listen, God is going to deal with Jezebel. God is going to deal with the Goliaths and the giants in your life. You just need to get up and start running towards your giant again. But you got to see him. You got to see him. You got to see God for who he is. You'll live different. You'll fight different. You'll approach your battles, your giants, your difficulties different when you know God for who he says he is, the Lord of heaven's armies who goes before you and fights for you. This last stage, this last stage is called imperfection. This last stage you're going to have to fight through is like, we're just, it's not an ideal situation. It's not the ideal situation and the circumstance. It's imperfect. And I'm not just talking about conditioned situations. Sometimes it's within ourselves that we see the imperfections within us that prevent us from, from moving forward in faith and, and accomplishing what God, from battling and doing the battle that we know God has called us to face the things that, that we know he's called us to face with him by our side. We just look at ourselves and we go, but how can I? How can I? This happened all, like uh, God in one part of the Bible, I'll show it to you, but in Judges chapter six, God, God approaches this man called Gideon and Gideon's hiding in this pit and he comes to Gideon and he tells him, you, I'm the Lord of heaven's armies and you're gonna be my man. You're gonna be my champion. You're, you're gonna be my warrior to lead the he heaven's armies, Gideon. And Gideon goes, uh, pardon me, Lord? But how? Come on, anyone ever done that to God? But how? How? Wait up. Uh, but how? We get caught up here so much, man, right here. But how? We're measuring ourselves by ourselves instead of God who called himself the Lord of heaven's armies. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest. Like my family, look where I came. We're jacked up. We're like, look at this. We're just terrible. Are you kidding me? Us? Us? And me? I'm the worst in my own family. And you're asking me, God, this is like... There's no way he was seeing himself. He's measuring himself by himself and by the family he came out of. The imperfections in the, within himself. Elijah did the same thing in 1 Kings chapter 19. He said, I had enough, Lord. Take my life. Like, I just want to call it quits now. I am no better than my ancestors. Now, listen to me, guys. Sometimes God will cause you. He'll allow you to experience a larger-than-life Goliath so that you can experience a larger-than-life God. Like this is the way, it, like he likes it this way. He'll, 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 it's a perspective problem because God's perspective, when you are in Christ, he sees something different. He sees you clean. He sees you righteous. He sees you forgiven. He sees you redeemed. He sees your potential. He sees your future. And he wants you to operate by the power of his perspective. He wants you to walk by faith. And because of this, he'll intentionally lead you to the dead end of a Red Sea with an Egyptian army at your back because he wants you to live by faith and to fight for you and to go before you. He'll intentionally stack the odds against you with a nine foot six giant against your five foot five ruddy self and a sling and a stone because, because this is what God, God, God want, wants everyone to know that there is a God in your house. The Lord of heaven's army dwells in your home and in your life, and he goes before you, and everyone will know that the battle belongs to the Lord. He, lo he loves it. He loves to put you in imperfect situations. In Judges chapter 7, you see Gideon actually did a really good job recruiting people. Too good of a job recruiting people. He had thousands of people to fight now as God's champion. As the Lord of heaven's armies called him to battle, he finally stopped wrestling with it, said, yes, grabs an army with him, and they're going to go defeat the Midians at God's word, the Lord of heaven's armies. And the Lord said to Gideon, Gideon, you got too many men. This is too perfect of a situation. This is too good. This looks too good. And I can't deliver Midian into their hands, or else Israel's going to boast and say, we did it in our own strength, because we're so awesome. And we're so mighty. And the Lord said to Gideon, I'm going to do it with 300 men. I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. You see, facing giants, it forces us to deepen our faith and depend on God. And God likes it this way. God brings his greatest miracles from imperfect situations and his greatest testimonies from imperfect people. Can I get an amen from someone who's a little imperfect? Yeah, yeah. 
It's, it's just our perspective problems that we don't see God the way that he sees himself and defines himself. And I mean, if we just saw him for who he says he is, you'd fight different. You'd live different. You'd approach your giants differently. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse four says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You're waiting for perfect, perfect, perfect in you, perfect in there. God's, God likes it that way. He likes to lead you to the dead end. He likes the odds stacked against you. It's the power of perspective. You see, when you start seeing things the way God sees them, you're going to walk in greater faith. And what's going to happen when you start seeing God this way, when you start having faith in Yahweh Saba, the Lord of heaven's armies, when you have that kind of, I'm just trying to elevate your faith today, help you see God the way that he says, the way he defines himself today. If you do, if you start putting your faith in that God, the Lord of heaven's armies, some things are going to start to happen in your life. Okay, here it is. You have that kind of faith. Number one, that kind of faith will shrink your giants. Your giants will shrink by the faith in the Lord of heaven's army. When I begin to look at things through God's viewpoints, it shrinks my problems. It gives you a new perspective. See, when you see your problem from God's point of view, everything in your life gets a whole lot manageable. When you got a big God, your problems look small. But when you got, when you got a small God, your problems look real big. If you don't know the God Yahweh Saba, the Lord of heaven's armies, commanding hundreds of millions of armies who goes before you and fights for you. If you don't know that big God, then your problems look real big. First Samuel chapter 17, it says, that as that giant Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. You know, faith shrinks my giants. You would think that the closer you get to the giant in your life, the bigger it becomes, but it's actually the opposite. The closer you get to the giant in your life, the smaller it becomes because you expose the lies of the enemy. It's just an illusion. It's an illusion. It's a lie. It's a deception. Some of you, are, some of you have the giant of fear in your life and you're, you've, been, you've been letting it taunt you and taunt you. If you would see God for who he was and start running at your giant again, the closer you get, you'd see it for the illusion that he is. That devil's a lie. You have nothing to be afraid of. It's, he's calling you out and talking about your past and everything that you're not. And it's a lie. You get closer to that enemy, you see the illusion for what it is. Wait a second. This ain't, this ain't the giant I thought he was. Faith shrinks. It, well, the longer you wait, though, the bigger your giant gets. The longer you listen to those lies, and you, 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 you wait and you sideline yourself, the bigger, the longer you let that addiction build in your house, the bigger it gets. It was the same day David heard the giant talking, was the same day he ran out to meet the giant. So let me say, say it this way. Stop dwelling on it and deal with it. Stop dwelling on it and deal with it. Okay? When you have this kind of faith, you can deal with it. You can run out to meet that giant. Faith shrinks my giants. Number two, when you have this kind of faith, this kind of faith moves God to act on your behalf. When you know where to run, what help to run to, I know Jehovah Saba, the Lord of heaven's armies, he will move on your behalf, act. You know, you give it to God and you move toward your giant, you face it. The reality is God fights for us, listen to me, and God fights with us. It's both. It's not one or the other, it's both. Because David didn't just give it to God and go hide. David gave it to God and ran out to meet his giant. God fights for us and he fights with us. No, I'm not saying like, you know, faith moves God to act on our behalf like he's some kind of genie. I'm not a name and claim it preacher or something like that. You are not God. He doesn't, he's not, he's sovereign and you are not, okay? You can't pull a slot machine and be like, I name and claim. That's not how God works, okay? It's, so, so let's not operate by that false theology of name it and claim it. But the reality is your faith in the Lord's of heaven's arm, it does move. Faith moves the hand and the heart of God. Okay. So, so Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter nine, verse 29, according to your what? According to your faith, let it be done to you. God says you get to choose how much I bless you. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Do you know why God has blessed my life? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed by God, not because I, I'm, I'm more wise or smart or I'm, I'm more anointed. There's a lot more people more anointed than me that can preach better than me, that are better leaders than me. The only reason why I'm blessed, you know why? I humbly expect God to bless me. I humbly expect God to do what his word says he says he could do. 
I, I expect it. According to your faith, it will be done to you. If you expect God to do a little, guess what? He's going to do a little in your life. If you expect God to do a lot, he's going to do a lot. If you expect God to do nothing, then he's going to do nothing. When you have faith in this God, the Lord of heaven's armies, then it moves the army of God to act on your behalf, going before you, fighting for you. Number three, faith. This faith unlocks the promises of God. Only faith can. Only faith can move. Not your pleading, not your crying, not your criticizing, not you trying to be good enough for it. That don't work. It's just faith that unlocks the promises of God. And there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Over 7,000. Now, what does the Bible say about those 7,000 promises? 2 Corinthians 1, 2. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. All of the promises God has made in the Bible, in his word, throughout the scripture, are yes in Christ through Christ. Faith, faith unlocks the promises of God. Number four, when I have this kind of faith, faith gives me the power to hold on. Man, when I know that God goes before me and is fighting for me and with me, this faith gives me some power to hold on. You know why this is important? Because faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. Faith often takes you through the problem. Faith doesn't always take away the pain. Faith gives you the ability to endure the pain. Faith doesn't always change the outcome, but faith always changes your outlook. It's the power of perspective. Faith doesn't make heaven on earth. It doesn't. Heaven, earth will never be heaven. There will always be failures and flops and duds and mistakes. We're always going to make those. We're going to embarrass ourselves. We're going to have pain and we're going to have pressures. We're going to have setbacks, all these things. But what does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9? We are pressed on every side by troubles but we're not crushed and broken. We're perplexed, meaning I don't know what's going to happen next. But how? I don't get it, God. We're perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We're attacked, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up and keep going. Proverbs says, though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. See, it's, it's human to fall, but it's righteous to get up. See, it doesn't make you righteous to not fall, the righteous rise again. The righteous are going to fail. We're going to, we're going to, but we're going to endure and get up. It's this kind of faith. When you know who God is, the Lord of heaven's armies, you know, he's fighting for you and with you and has gone before you, gives you the power to hold on. Here's the last one. Number five, faith opens the door for a miracle in your life. When you have this kind of faith, that God fights for you. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe he brought you to this place where you are perplexed, crushed but not broken, where you're facing off against bad odds, against a giant that continues to taunt you. He's been taunting. You haven't defeated him yet. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he brought you to the, to the dead end of a Red Sea. Who knows that but for him to reveal himself as the Lord, of heaven's armies to go before you, to fight for you. That when people see what happens at your dead end, when people see what happens when the odds are stacked against you, they say, there's gotta be a God in his life. There's gotta be a God in her. Maybe, maybe God caused it so that he could do a miracle in your life, in your marriage, in your future. Maybe God wants to do, and it's only, the, it's only faith that can actually open the door for a miracle in your life. But check it out. The opposite of, is true of that as well. Look at this verse in Matthew 13, 58. It says, And Jesus did not do many miracles there in his hometown because of their lack of faith. Their lack of faith caused Jesus not to do many miracles. Because you say, Well, I don't see a lot of miracles in my life, Pastor. Well, I wonder why. What's your perspective? Faith sees from God's perspective. Are you seeing from God's perspective? Are you operating by God's perspective? Are you stepping out into the battlefield in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies? Or do you sit fearfully, idly by, not fighting the battles the way that God has called you to battle, fight, or maybe even fighting them at all? Faith can move mountains, but your doubt can create them. If you study the Bible and you study history, you find every time God moves on earth and God does a miracle, every time it's because somebody believed. Somebody 
have faith. Faith opens the door to miracles. Mark 11, Jesus said, have faith in God. And if you have faith in God and you don't doubt, you could tell this mountain, get up and jump into the sea. Whatever you ask for in prayer will be yours if only you have faith. What is this? What, you know what this means? It, it means that the laws of faith supersede the laws of physics. That even though the facts are what they are, even though the reality is what it is in your life, even though your account says it, even though the report, the doctor's report says it, even though your past, whatever facts that there are, the laws of faith supersede all laws of physics. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.